This meeting is being recorded. Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. I'm Sylvia Earle, National Geographic Explorer, founder of Mission Blue, and an ocean elder. Thank you, ocean elders, for sponsoring this program. And this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community from around the world on topics of wonder and interest. And you're encouraged to put questions into the Q&A box, and we'll get through as many of them as possible towards the end of the hour. And we want to start off by reminding everyone that the world is blue. <laughs> Never forget it. <laughs> Today, we are so grateful to be joined again by Ian Urbina. He is uh, the, the previous guest, and we just want to really dive in with him. He is a Pulitzer-winning investigative journalist focused on the dark and often criminal aspects of the industrial fishing industry, particularly on the high seas. And if you have not read Outlaw Ocean yet, or seen the film, or seen the film, mm -hmm. you must do so. Mm -hmm. here, here. And <laughs> um, share it widely. Share it widely. Deeply. Deeply. So thank you, Ian, for joining us today. It's nice to be back. Yeah. So tell us about some of the work that you've been doing since you last joined us. So um, the biggest project is one that uh, was published about two months ago, and it was a culmination of a four-year investigation focused on the Chinese distant water fishing fleet, but even more broadly, it ultimately focused on the global seafood industry, which those two things are connected because um, so much of seafood around the world um, ends up either being caught by Chinese distant water vessels and or processed in Chinese processing facilities. So even vessels that are French flagged and in French waters or Canadian or US flagged in US waters um, often gets processed in China. So um, this ended up being a series about the entire global seafood industry and concerns that exist uh, with regard to um, especially forced labor, but also illegal fishing connected to the Chinese fleet and the Chinese processing plants. Wow. I am going to try to share my screen for a minute and show uh, just a short piece about the some of the squid um, fishing that you are particularly working on. Let's see if we can. And how you go about getting the information that you acquire. Here we go. Here we go. All the way around the ship, you can get a 360. Yeah. Just don't go, don't, don't go across. Yeah. <laughs> Brown. I need to stop now. You can come back. 
ejaculate. All right. More, more. It was show. All right. <laughs> That's just a tiny taste. Just a tiny taste. And Gigi's put in the chat the links to the full video, um, which is I think about 12 minutes long, and some others that are really quite compelling. People just don't know. And just the very thought that life in the ocean is regarded as seafood, seafood, all the, of what we consume on the land is not regarded as land food all lumped together. <laughs> when you have, a, uh, you know, a hamburger, it, it's probably beef. If you have Kentucky fried, it's probably chicken. When you have fish sticks or catch of the day or fish and chips, oh, I have no idea what kind of fish, even if it is fish, that you are being sold. It, it's crazy that we so are so complacent about what we take out of the ocean, wild animals that are just mushed together as seafood. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I, I think um, if you think of the place, the at sea realm as a concept, and it is a place where things live. So within the place are its, its creatures. Um, if you just think of that as a concept, like, and you look at that concept as it's traveled through time, it's, it's as you're saying, Sylvia, very different than the concept of other places. You know, um, the creatures are thought of differently, valued differently, even the very notion of how they um, replenish or don't themselves um, historically has been misconceived um, in literature, in popular imagination, in movies, in policy, in all these places, the core intellectual history of the oceans has a, a different um, um, trajectory than so many other places. And, and I think that's one of the core problems um, in uh, explaining why um, it's more uh, taken for granted than uh, a lot of realms on land. Well, we're getting some traction with whales and other mammals and certainly seabirds that were taken without, without thinking about the consequences until not so long ago. And we just need to understand the connection about what we, the way we connect with whales, we should be connecting with tunas and squid and shrimp and lobsters, cod, herring, the whole, whole spectrum of life in the ocean that is vital to making the planet habitable, not just for them, but for us. Mm -hmm. It's this network of, this living network. Earth is alive. It's not just rocks and water. It's and people understand that. I mean, I think you look at the Amazon. If you say the Amazon forest to someone, they think of a biosphere. They're not thinking of a species by species. They're thinking of the way that all the creatures interact with the plant life and the flora, the fauna, and it's a space, right? It's not um, reduced to like, I like this creature in the Amazon. It's the Amazon. And people understand the Amazon also not just as a pretty place, but as a essential component to the existential status of the planet. It's our lungs. You know, like, I think that needs to happen with the oceans. It needs to be conceived of as a place that has yes, residents who should be protected, but also a fundamental, vital um, role in the survival of the big ball, that is Earth. And, Earth is a habitable planet. And particularly on the, I think on the high seas, because it, that is sort of like a global common, right? You know, it's about half the world. About half the world. And when we have sort of a few countries that are really doubling down on extraction, it's kind of taking from everyone. Mm-hmm, yeah. No, it's it's cutting flowers from a public park, right? And and huh. the and the squid are so important as a as a food source to these other animals, to the seabirds, the whales, and so many other creatures. Their very abundance, at least historically, is there should be evidence 
of their importance in the carbon cycle, the phosphor cycle, the, the cycles of life, the chemistry of the planet, and how critical a link they are. I mean, starting with photosynthesis, carbon captured, oxygen generated, by these the miniature forests of life, the phytoplankton, consumed by little guys, consumed by the squid, consumed by the small fish. These are critical to the creatures who can't get to the plankton, can't mm -hmm. get to the plankton, and often cannot get to the zooplankton. They need these translators, the squid, the krill, the small fish, and we have attacked this critical link in the chemistry of the ocean. Mostly, I mean, really all out since the middle of the 20th century, especially since the 1980s. And it continues to ratchet up, scale up, instead of recognizing that the knowledge is there. The red flags are waving. We've got to really improve the methods of giving nature a break to capture carbon and reduce emissions of carbon if we are to have any hope of stabilizing Earth as a habitable planet. Mm -hmm. and, and we're subsidizing the extraction of ocean wildlife by the ton and even the marketing of wildlife by the ton. It, it's glossed over when we call it seafood. Mm -hmm. Things that it's okay if somebody must have checked it out if it appears in your local supermarket or restaurants, but not bravo, all of the SDA bravo to you for just asking the question that any little kid should ask. Oh, fish, squid, where did you come from? How did you get to my plate? How did you get to my market? Yeah. And oh, it's an amazing story. Can you, can you tell us a little bit? Ian, about the work you've done on looking at the uh, history of how we developed this appetite for squid? Yeah, I mean, squid is, um, the backstory on squid in the U.S. is kind of a, a larger parable of, you know, unintended consequences, and even to some degree, good intentions gone awry. Um, in the 70s, there was a growing recognition by academics and federal officials that um, certain species were being harvested too aggressively and were collapsing, you know, certain fisheries were collapsing and, and that they needed to guide the market, if you will, a bit more towards other more abundant options. So the federal government, um, tried to put a question out to smart people, you know, academics, and how could we get people in the U.S. Um, to like squid, you know, because there doesn't seem to be an interest in it beyond, you know, there's a long running history um, in Southern Europe and in the Mediterranean cultures and Asian cultures of eating squid, but in the U.S., not so much uh, until the early 80s, really. And so they put out um, a request for research and, a variety of different folks said, okay, well, first stop calling it squid, make it more exotic, call it calamari, and that will make it less icky seeming because people have a vision of the slimy tentacled creature and they don't necessarily want to eat that. And second, fry it. Um, and those were the two geniuses from, from some marketing types at MIT and other places, University of San Diego, uh, San Diego um, and um, those two moves changed the game. And within the course of five, six years, this thing called calamari, you know, fried calamari, went from something that you only found in niche restaurants on the coast in the U.S. to, you know, Red Lobster in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, like chain restaurants were serving it. And that's it just rocketed. Um, and again, it was motivated by federal officials who thought we need to take some pressure off of these species types and redirect consumption towards these, you know, it was, again, as the fatal flaw in many of these plans, it forgets the, the scaling problem. And when you take a, a, a small bore fix and you put it on steroids, it becomes a monster. And that's what the globalized version of calamari is now. It's a massive, uh, ever hungry, 
marketplace that's unsustainably pulling um, squid out of the ocean. So Ian, it, it speaks to the habit that we have of looking at nature, wild animals, whatever, we call them natural resources, which means free goods. What can we access from nature? We don't have to pay for it, it's just there for us to take. And what you're describing for squid is also what happened with sharks. Mm -hmm. Both were regarded as, and krill, underutilized species. They're there for us humans to utilize, to make them useful. If they're not useful, they're regarded as underutilized or trash fish or bycatch or something not worth accounting for. The cost of trawling the deep sea or whatever, the, the losses that are incurred are not considered important because they're not destroying anything that we regard as useful equals marketable. It's a mindset that can't put a dollar sign on it. It doesn't, it's, it's not worth considering. Sharks in 1980 were deliberately marketed by my, my <laughs> agency where I once served as the chief scientist, NOAA. Mm -hmm. They were marketed uh, deliberately trying to establish a way to take advantage of these underutilized creatures and deliberate efforts to connect to Asian markets where they did consume sharks. And it's one of the many factors that has really resulted in depleting sharks down to where they were in the 1980s to about 10% of what they were. I don't know what the numbers are for squid, but it has to be a similar kind of devastating trajectory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to your last point, that's yet another problem. No one knows what the numbers are for squid, and that gets to the sort of lack of data, lack of tracking, because the most squid fishing happens on the high seas, and there's very poor and minimal data. So what little studies there have been done seem to indicate that the global squid stocks are decreasing, but it's iffy data, uh, and that's a big blind spot, you know, um, that, as you know, pervades a lot of fishery science. Um, but I think you're right. Like the the, the the problem of reducing citizens to consumers, like, you know, the problem of reducing things to products, places to, you know, is a, is a problem of viewing the world through a market lens um, and a utilitarian lens. Um, and so I think that that's quite right, as you say. I think an, another yet other additional way to view on a meta level, the problem here is the problem of hidden costs. There aren't actually honest assessments of the actual cost of things. You know, there are these sort of made up back of the envelope mathematical versions of this thing costs X. But if you really put that under a microscope and say, well, wait, you're defining costs in this narrow way. The cost of this can of tuna, the cost of this plate of calamari is X. And then if you unpack that price, five bucks, it's, oh, well, a dollar was in the work, a dollar was in the fuel, a dollar was in the transport, a dollar was in the processing, and a buck is left for the guys that want to make some money. You know, like simply put, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, like those numbers don't look accurate to me. Like, okay, how was that done at a dollar for the labor? What are the hidden costs? Was that labor actually paid that? Or is that just a made up number Were those labor there on their own choice, you know, except you, you get my drift. So I think hidden costs of so much of what we consume is, is a major problem. You see that with carbon dumping in the sky or extracting of biomass from the oceans. These are all hidden costs that we only recently have started trying to reckon with and say, okay, that's actually a cost that's going to catch up with us at some point called climate change or called ocean depletion. Those are the costs when they catch up. And can you, can you give us some sense of Sort of the scope of the number of vessels that you were dealing with out there in some of these areas and that are all sort of then bringing the the extracted wildlife back to the to the processing points 
for distribution. Yeah, I mean, so I think like, again, your listeners are pretty fluent, already fluent crowd on this, but I'll go back to sort of square one anyway. So let's think about some basic definitions. One is the distant water fishing fleet. What do I mean by that? What I mean is those vessels, and there are different definitions that different folks use, but our use was this is, if we're going to define this fleet, uh, this body of ships as distant water, we're referring to those ships that spend most of their time fishing on the high seas, so international waters or in foreign waters. Okay, so that's our definition. Then the next question is, okay, well, why are you so fixated on the Chinese? Why is that fair? Um, are you beating up on the Chinese? Okay, we focus on the Chinese because when you look at the planet and you look at all the fleets, the distant water fishing fleets that are out there, the Taiwanese, the South Koreans, the Americans, the, you know, the, the Thai, um, you, uh, the Chinese, there is one superpower of seafood and it is undisputed and far beyond everyone else. And that's China. If your metric is distant water fishing fleet, China by its own count has 2,700 distant water fishing vessels. Wow. Other analysts, you know, on the opposite extreme. So think tanks in Washington who've tried to get what they say is a more accurate number, put the number up by around 17,000. We crunched the data and found, we thought it was probably around 6,500. Now scale. The next largest distant water fishing fleet has less than 300 vessels. Okay, so by the most conservative estimate, that's 10 times bigger. Chinese is 10 times bigger. And, it, you know, so they're way bigger than everyone else. And that doesn't count metrics of what about the hours they're spending fishing? What about the tonnage they're pulling out of the water? Okay. And then if you want a third metric or an additional metric of how China is the undisputed superpower and the most important player on the earth, it's the on-land seafood processing, right? So 80% um, of what comes into the U.S. is imported. The vast majority, well, the largest country, the country that produces the most of that is China. Mm -hmm. And that's true in Europe and Canada and everywhere else. So, um, and most of the infrastructure is in China, the huge processing plants, mostly in one province, Shandong province. So if you're me and you're looking at concerns on the ocean, human rights, environmental, what have you, and seafood is a big player on the ocean, you got to reckon with China. And it's also super important, not just because of its size, but because of its opaqueness. There is no place harder to do journalism than at or in China. They're just opaque. And the U.S. companies that work there know that and know they have to play by certain rules if they're going to operate there. So for all those reasons, it was like, okay, we really got to turn our spotlight on China for all those reasons. Well, but here's the thing. There's nothing traditional about China's high seas, distant water fishing. This is all in the recent decades, scaling up on a, scale, on a level that when you think about the ocean as the overall home for most of life on earth, I mean, it's 97% of the biosphere, that living system shapes the habitability of earth. And never before, never in all of the history of humankind has there been the capacity to wipe out, destroy, mine life on the scale that we are now extracting life out of the ocean, upending the chemistry, not just of the ocean, but of the planet as a whole. Yeah. And yeah. we're doing it with our eyes wide open. Yeah, it's shocking. No, and, and to, to your point, 1983, 1982, that was the crucial year when the definitional switch of squid occurred in the U.S. So between 81 and 85 is that jump that I mentioned from San Diego, obscure restaurant, to Tulsa, Oklahoma, a red lobster. Okay, same time frame, 1986, 13 ships left China. That was the launch of the modern... Chinese distant water fishing fleet. There were 13 ships, China National Fisheries Corporation, huge ceremony. They went to Africa, West, West Africa in particular, and it was like the beginning of their distant water fishing fleet. That's not that long ago, 1981, 1986. All this began in that time frame, And from then to now, it's just scaled up and scaled up and scaled up. And now we're realizing just how dangerous all that is. Oh, to put it in perspective, 1986 is when nations came together at last to have a moratorium on killing whales. 
commercial killing of whales. It's also the year, curiously, that Penny Chisholm, MIT <laughs> scientist, really zeroed in and discovered this minute little organism called Prochlorococcus that may be responsible for as much as 20% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. It wasn't even known to exist until a new method of, of looking at the microscopic, ultra-microscopic scale, the existence of this little blue-green microbe, a bacterium, that now we know it exists. Before then, we were simply unaware of where much of, of the Earth's life support system, um, it, how it is generated. And I mean, we're, there's still so much more we need to understand about how the planet functions. We certainly know enough to know that it is really dangerous to do what we're doing in terms of the volume of industrial extraction of life from the seed. And, and we do use the word harvest, which is a misnomer if ever there was one. It's not like it's corn. <laughs> not, not exactly. We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're mining or we're hunting and gathering, but we're certainly not harvesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know a big spotlight came not too long ago when the, I guess it's primarily the Chinese fleet was sort of perched right on the edge of the Galapagos. And that was one of the areas that you mentioned there uh, you know, in the in the opening video. And it's right on the edge of like this World Heritage Site and every protected animal in Galapagos, I think just about everyone would eat squid um, at some point and they're it's part of the, part of the food chain. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just kind of like come right up to the edge of a protected area and then go for it. Just take as much as you possibly mm -hmm. can. Yeah, I mean, and I think, again, going back to that first point about the timing of all this, if we're thinking about kind of meta drivers, the rise of globalization, so the rise of the notion that products can be decentralized and supply chains can be extended and sort of tentacle-esque um, become convoluted, and that will benefit um, buyers and sellers and everyone you know, without getting into the debate about whether that's all true or all false, um, that all happened in the 80s, right? The mid 80s is really when, and two specific things happened that were hugely important and relevant to squid, right? One is containerization of commerce. So the standardization of the shipping container, mm -hmm. like, hey, we're all going to use the same size so that we can make port traffic much more efficient and we can move things. That was radical. I mean, that that was a one of the most important things in all globalization was the containerization of shipping. Um, and that's part of how you can now understand how it would make sense in some weird way that you could catch squid in, the, in Monterey, freeze it, send it to China, unfreeze it, process it, freeze it again, send it back and serve it as locally fished in the restaurant in Monterey. And economically and in every other way, there's a logic to that. It only makes sense because of containerization, right? Um, uh, and you can do that transaction pretty cheaply now. Um, so, and then the other thing that happened was China became the world sweatshop in the, in the 80s. It really launched itself as, you know, kind of a place where the rest of the world felt okay using incredibly cheap mass production workers, whether they're making Nike shoes or computer chips or filleting uh, squid, cleaning squid or whatever, um, China became the hub for the rest of the world. And that also launched globalization. Again, now we're seeing the hidden costs of like, wait, so what's going on in those factories? And are we okay with that? And what are the consequences of containerizing and, and shipping all this stuff over there and sending it back? What are the emissions of that whole process? Um, you know, there are a lot of like good questions that need to be asked about the hidden costs of, of that phenomena. So it's not just inexpensive labor. What you're really putting the spotlight on is slave labor. What else could you call it? Yeah. And so just to sharpen that a bit, you know, so it's again worth taking a step back. So in China, there's a province called Xinjiang province. And it's in the far, it's the most landlocked piece of earth on the planet. It's mm -hmm. the furthest from water of anywhere on earth, about 2,500 miles. And it's this province on the far 
western side of China. Muslim minority um, uh, population there called Uyghurs. And for several decades now, the Chinese government has been aggressively repressing these folks. And repressing sounds like a soft word for what's going on. Internment camps with over a million people, forced sterilization, um, uh, putting folks in the tens of thousands, mostly young men and women on trains and transporting them to other provinces to work in lockdown facilities for garments or solar panels or squid. Um, this is what's happening there. So the US government had a law that said, look, any products that come into the US that are touched by Uyghur workers, workers from Xinjiang, um, are banned because it's state-sponsored forced labor. There's one other law and one other category of worker that is the same, and that's North Korean. State-sponsored forced labor. That law is called CATSA. The Uyghur law is called UFLPA, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. The two laws are the same. They basically say no products touched by those people are allowed to come in here because it's so definitively forced labor. Okay. So what did we look at? We looked at are there Xinjiang or Uyghur workers and or North Korean workers in seafood processing? Most folks would have said that's a waste of time. There's no way because processing is happening over on the eastern shore, 2,000 miles away. It wouldn't make sense for all those Uyghurs to be all the way over there on the opposite side of the country. You're wasting your time. And North Korea is also pretty far away. Turns out they're wrong. After COVID, everything locked down. Seafood industry, big moneymaker for China, had a labor shortage. Turned to the government and said, hey, we need some help. We need we need guys on the line. Women mostly actually on the line. It was mostly It's mostly worked by women. And uh, the government said, we're here to help. And so they set up a huge labor transfer program, moving tens of thousands of workers forcefully without the, you know, again, if you say no, and these folks go door to door and they say, hey, look, you've got a job, be ready to leave next week. You're going to get transported. We'll tell you what you're doing when you get there. If they say no, they get locked up. Um, so this is not something like uh, poverty alleviation, which is what the government calls it. That's, um, you know, a misnomer. Um, so this is the forced labor that we revealed. And again, it's very, very big concern because a lot of the seafood's coming to the U.S. in clear violation of these federal laws. And we're working on the North Korean front now. And it's a similar story. There's a huge presence, different province, different location, but the same basic story of North Koreans being forcibly put in factories and having to work. Yeah, it's just shocking. And and then the just what goes on on the vessels themselves, because as we were seeing there, you know, the the ship will be at sea for months or years even, uh, just getting refueled periodically. And then they have those freezer ships that kind of slide in alongside and offload stuff. But the but the men on board um, are just living in terrible conditions. Can you? Activity, yeah. That? Yeah, I mean, so that's a, a separate category, equally distressing. The story there is this. Most of these contracts are for two years. They're two-year tours. If you take a typical squid jigger, Chinese squid jigger, it's probably a 40 to 50 man crew. The demographics are probably maybe five to 10 Chinese upper level officers. And pre-COVID, the rest of those guys would be Indonesian, Philippines, or Africa. Okay. After COVID, when everything locked down, the industry had a problem. They couldn't get the guys. And so they turned to, and this is mostly a male workforce at sea. So they said, look, we got to start recruiting inland in China. So they began targeting, you know, rural folk who have no real literacy when it comes to how to avoid getting bamboozled in a messed up contract. And so they really aimed at these very desperately poor, mostly rural inland Chinese Chinese workers. Um, the recruiters are in places like Shadow Port. They're along the coast. And they began loading the ships up with these guys. And same tour, two-year, three-year tours, stay at, at sea for the whole time. And they're stuck out there. And if things go awry, the guy decides, the guy gets sick, the guy gets injured. Um, the guy simply wants out of the job. Um, there's horrific violence um, and he wants out. They don't have the option to leave. And so we just documented, and that's human trafficking. That's you know illegal by most definitions of international law, holding workers in a captive role. And then a lot of other forms of lower grade, but equally severe. So criminal level neglect, a guy gets something called beriberi, which is a deficiency of B1. It's a nutrition, you, know, it's, you don't eat, you're eating too much rice or pasta, essentially white rice or uh, refined pasta, you know, ramen noodles, and you don't get enough thymine or, or B1 over many weeks, you get 
berry berry and it's a terrible way to get sick and die and um, no one should be dying from it because a simple tablet taken a supplement costs two bucks will prevent you from getting berry berry and guys are dying from berry berry and they ask you know it's horribly painful you start swelling up and um in the cases we documented they beg to be sent back to shore and we're not allowed um so we've got a whole variety of kind of human trafficking and abuses on the ships as well and isn't there also evidence that these fishing vessels are not just human trafficking but also are conduits for other forms of trafficking drugs arms you name it yeah so that's regional so so wildlife and drugs. Okay. So drugs, if you're going to look at the drug story on fishing, you should really, one should really look at the Caribbean and look at um, waters near Venezuela and Colombia. Um, so uh, South America on the Northern part um, and, and actually coastal Central America. So Honduras, you've got a big problem. And, and what's often there for the obvious intuitive reasons, you know, there aren't many cops checking up on what's being carried on the vessel and it's easy to hide stuff in the carcasses of shark or whatever, you know, tuna, you put the drugs in the body and no one's going to get in the freezer and find it. Um, so it's a, it's a decent way to move things country to country. Um, the drug story I have found is pretty localized in those regions and awful. The wildlife trafficking is not a story I've looked at much. Obviously shark finning, is a serious issue. Um, some places it's legal, so it's not a crime. Um, it's a travesty, but it's not an official crime. Um, and other places it's, it is illegal. But yes, these are the vessels, not squid jiggers um, typically, but tuna longliners, tuna purseiners. Um, th that's where you're going to find a decent shark component to their trade and a, and, a, and a supplemental way to pay the guy's wages. Often we found, we've seen contracts where um, it says you're going to make X amount of dollars, which is, you know, a poverty wage. Um, but you can supplement your wage by keeping the off catch or they have certain terms for it. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and so essentially what that means is you're on a tuna long liner. And when you pull up sharks and you're aiming to pull up sharks, cause you're using a steel lead, a certain kind of hook that you would only use if you're trying to get sharks, not tuna. Um, so you have those. And if you land some sharks, the guys get to fin them and they get to sell and keep the profits of the fins as a supplemental for them um, and then toss the money overboard. So what what can consumers do? What can what can the general public do uh, you know when it comes to trying to make some impact on on stop halting some of this stuff? What about high seas protection and what consumer choices can we do? I mean, I'll start on a broad level and then toss it to Sylvia to sort of sharpen the point. Um, I always say, if you're just an average person like myself, um, oh, first thing, person. come on, <laughs> I am, I actually am. But um, uh, first, think of yourself in an accurate but multivariable way. So you have multiple roles. You you vote, you buy stuff. You talk to people, you probably give money to things like as donations, small or large causes you believe in. Okay. So let's just take those. You're an interlocutor. You talk to people, your partner, your kids, uh, your neighbor. So um, take some time, learn about the stuff, read, read, watch movies, whatever, get, get informed and talk to people, sort of spread the word that that has value. It has social value. Um, it changes how people think. You're a voter, uh, you know, we're all busy and we don't have time to do all these things all the time, but you know, you're about to vote for someone and you like his or her policies on such and such. Think about this realm of issues. Um, and if you can't find something, ask someone, you know, in their office, force them to take a stand on it um, by getting a question on, on the matter. Um, you're a donor, a lot of this work is done by, you know, NGOs. Mission Blue, you know, and they rely on um, average folks giving a little bit, um, but a lot of those. So, you know, this is a good realm and there's, it's a very underfunded realm um, compared to online concerns um, and journalism is one part of that, but not the only. Um, and then, you know, your buyer. Um, I'm not going to say which to buy and which not to buy and what to eat, but it is a very powerful way 
for you to exert agency and have influence in, in deciding what you want to consume. And there are lots of folks, we put some of them up on our website that specialize in giving counsel on these things. I'm pushing that community to think more about not just the marine issues, but also the human issues holistically and to try Absolutely. to rank things with both of them. But there's good work being done and you can go consult them. And then there are bigger policies, Sylvie, that you can speak to that also would help. Yeah, just in the past year, nations have come together to at least have a framework of protection for the high seas. And nations are stepping up to be a part of that, but it takes ratification. I mean, dozens of nations have already signed on, but it still has to be ratified to become legal. And it takes a certain number of nations to tip toward ratification, toward acceptance of this as international policy. And the biodiversity concerns, the commitment to protect at least 30% of the land and the sea in the next seven years by 2030. And it's a tall order since only about 3% of the ocean is really highly or fully protected, mm -hmm. about 7% with some form of protection, 15% more or less, of the land with parks and reserves. And some people get the impression that, you know, that's hands off. This is, you know, we can't afford to, to lock away, as they seem to think of it. But there's a new way, a new appreciation for what's happening. And it's brought about because of, I think, the growing awareness that the planet is really changing. The climate is changing. Uh, and you can debate, I don't think there's no debate about the cause, <laughs> look in the mirror, but <laughs> that, that it is changing is irrefutable. Warmer, more storms, more intense storms, and it's happening on our watch. It's happening right now, 21st century. And you can peel back the layers and look at what has happened in the last 50 years or so that is driving this radical change in the nature of nature and then you can ask yourself what can i do about it well a lot of things but most importantly is i think you point out Ian, get up to speed with knowing what the issues are ask questions you can find the answers the knowledge is there but really integrating it into your everyday choices knowing that all things considered most important thing that we take from the ocean it is not oil gas minerals fish squid krill whatever it's our existence our existence really depends on maintaining the integrity of the ocean systems that shape planetary chemistry that generate most of the oxygen capture much of the carbon and hold it that maintain Earth as a habitable planet. I mean, this sounds like nerdy science stuff, but it's it's what the kids of today are really grasping and locking into. They they seem to get it more than some of the ones who are currently occupying lofty offices, whether they're in industries or in governments. And with China. It's this great push from where they were in the 1980s, in the, in the 70s, their, their participation after having been relatively closed for mm -hmm. such a long time, now emerging and building economic strength by taking from nature, taking from the ocean, the accounting base for squid and krill, they're also in Antarctica, mm -hmm. to capture krill by the time. It's free goods. It's owned by nobody. And everybody. And everybody. <laughs> and, and therefore, to your way of accounting for what is the cost, a tuna has a zero accounting base when it's alive. It's only when it's caught when it's dead and it's marketable 
that you can put a dollar sign on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, with squid, they're free. Cost to get out there and capture them and process them and send them around the world, but the products quotes the animals themselves. And these are creatures that you know, we ought to have some respect for those animals that have been around for hundreds of millions of years. They, mm. they, of anything that has happened in human society. And we just have this amazingly brutal way of looking at nature as as products, as there for us to, to just take and do with as we will. It used to be on the land mammals for their furs, yeah. birds for their feathers. We've kind of shifted our attitude about wildlife on the land that we don't even think of ocean life as wildlife. Never mind that it's the biggest wildlife trade on the planet, what we take. Yeah. So well, many efforts are now in motion to rewild places on the land. We are subsidizing this dewilding of the ocean on a mega scale, and it's taking us and the planet and the people who are involved in this to a very bad place. Mm -hmm. Ordinarily. Fast. So. I mean, like, the trajectory mm -hmm. is not very promising. But so thank you for being the uh, illuminating of these activities that most people just have no idea. I mean, without your effort, you and your team just putting the spotlight on without making a judgment call, just here it is, folks. Yeah, that's it. Here it is. What Now that you know, look in the mirror. What are you going to do about it? Because everybody... It's the power of choice. Well, thanks. No, Ms. Were you going to say something? Uh, okay. I just wanted to. I just wanted to ask you uh, before we jump over to Q and A. Could you talk a little bit? Uh, tell us a little bit about the you know some of the technology you've been using yeah. to to identify and and document some of the uh, things that are going on and what role has a uh, TikTok played in the in your. Oh, in your a good news story, yeah. <laughs> a good use, use of it. Uh, yeah, so again, think of the reporting as two different realms, the at sea and the onshore. The at sea, um, the reporting challenges were, let's get out to four places where there are a lot of these ships. What were those four places? So high seas Galapagos, the high seas Falkland Islands, the sea border with North Korean waters and the coast of West Africa. So separate reporting trips. So we get out there to the places where there are hundreds of Chinese vessels, most of them squid jiggers. And um, the next challenge is, can we get on board? That's not been done before by a Western journalist. And there are lots of reasons it probably won't happen. Most often when we got there, we would communicate with these vessels bridge to bridge, radio to radio, and try to talk with the captain and officers and slowly inch our way towards them, you know, metaphorically speaking, warm things up a little bit over days. Then we would inch a little bit closer, get in a sort of small fast boat or skiff um, and get within line of sight so they could see us, wave to them, talk with them on the radio. How's it going? Anyone sick? You know, we just kind of want to, we're not here to demonize you, which we aren't still, but we're here to just sort of show light on this work that you do that most people don't know about. Um, then if we get lucky, a moment comes in that stage where we can ask, hey, any chance we could come on board? We'd like to bring a gift. You know, we have um, fruits and vegetables and something we doubt you've got anymore on board and we'd like to break bread with you. <clears throat> in rare occasion, the captain said yes, <clears throat> excuse me, which was unprecedented, you know, yeah. and offered incredible um access to the real conditions on the vessels. How are the guys? What are their living quarters? You know, what does the supply chain look like in terms of um, are they keeping track of different catch and where it came from, et cetera, et cetera. And just really look at the ship top to bottom. 
Um, in some cases, crew on the vessels, Chinese crew asked to be rescued when the, the minder stepped away and would talk with us. The crew would say, I'm being held against my will. There's violence on board. They confiscated my password, you know, so really dramatic stuff. Most often, though, the ships would would the Chinese ships would flee when we got close and they would pull up their gear and bolt. And so we would chase them um, and put a message in a bottle water bottle weighed down with rice inside some cigarettes and and hard candy things we know the crew will like a note written in indonesian english and chinese because that's probably the crew on board a buoy and um a pen put it in get close enough i throw it on board sometimes the guys open it read it and write back and send it back and so we had some you know it's a ridiculously painstaking process but it really worked well a lot of times they gave us phone numbers for family back home and we could piece together these lives the lives of these guys um, that's the on water portion, the on land portion, totally different game. How can we get eyes into the factories, factories that you're not allowed to even go near? Well, TikTok. So do yen it's called in China and it's the equivalent and it's hugely popular and it's just like us, just like the West, like average folk posting banal stuff. Hey mom, here I am on a train. Here I am at the plant. Just hi, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, you know, like just da daily stuff that people are doing are posting on this platform. But a lot of times they're posting it in the factory or on the train as the state is transferring them or lots of stuff that gets by the censors in China that don't scrub it because they figure it's too, who cares about this stuff? But we care. And so we mine thousands and thousands of those videos to find clear evidence of Uyghurs or Xinjiang workers or North Korean workers in these plants. And you know, because there is someone whose account lists them as from this city in North Korea or from this place in Xinjiang, in Xinjiang province. And here's the geotag of where they shot. And here's another video they pushed it with the factory sign at the front. And here's boxes behind them with brand names of French and American and Canadian companies. It's gold, you know, from a journalistic yeah. point of view. We're like, you can't get better evidence than that. So that footage was amazingly powerful and useful to prove that there were these banned workers in these plants. And then, you know, again, Companies have told us, no, no, we don't have anything to do with that plant. Oh, well, here's a video in your box is right behind the worker. So yeah, how do you explain that? And then long silence. Or, And then the other thing we use is a lot of the companies, the really, really big companies, multi-billion dollar companies in China, have their own internal newsletters. And for some reason, they're very, very open, probably about, you know, thanking the government for having transferred them a bunch of workers from Xinjiang province. And, and they're, they're talking about it really opening. We had a meeting with the, this bureau and such and such. And and, they're, and so we mined that stuff. A lot of it's been now pulled off the internet since we published. But back then we found troves of these things, pulled them down and went through them painstakingly to find other evidence types. Um, and it found, you know, we land, I'll give you an example, two plants, Haibo and Haidu in Shandong province. These two plants alone um, process 30% of all squid in China and 17% of all squid coming to the US go through those two plants. Both of them have Uyghur workers. Well, that's a big problem for all the U.S. companies that are getting squid from those plants because now they're in violation of federal law because they're tied to workers that they're not allowed to be tied to. So this is what we accomplished. That's incredible. It's just it's like so vital to to make those connections and to and have that kind of, uh, you know, irrefutable evidence that that this is what's going on. No. Yeah, I mean, the, the industry still says, well, yeah, but what's the evidence? You know, th th there's just a, a spin machine around oh, yeah. any big multi-billion, whether it's tobacco or oil and gas or what have you. Like, they always have amazingly clever, you know, spinsters. And the, the spin that of any spin that we've heard is, but could you walk us through again what the evidence is? And so we became <laughs> frustrated with it. So we basically built a video that's a 20 minute explainer saying, here's the ship and here's the satellite information we use to track it to the port. And here are the trucks. We hired some investigators to actually do on-site filming of the, tr the stuff getting moved from the ship to the truck. And then they followed the truck to the plant. And now here's the plant. And now here's the footage of guys in the plant. And now here's their Uyghur card. Yeah. What more evidence do you need? You know, like exactly. that's as good as it gets. Um, exactly. but and and I love seeing the use of the you know the the drones and then the little uh, uh, autonomous helicopters and things like that as well as things that and dive 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 and dive 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 of course you That's know right. there was I, I was nervous I was nervous seeing that diver go in I was like oh my god he's gonna get squid jigged he's gonna like I know I know yeah <laughs> yeah but it was amazing like again that's all not an evidentiary ambition it's all how can we make average viewers feel like they're seeing something 
that blows their mind. And yeah. like, we got to get in the water and show the squid underwater being hooked and pulled out of the water. That's a, you know, kind of a presentation and it's tough, but if you're really going to do good journalism, you've got to go the extra mile to really dazzle folks to keep their attention because the, yeah. the supply chain stuff is dry. So you got to spice it up with great visuals. Sure. It's like Sylvia did a similar thing with the Menhaden, Chesapeake, uh, Bay. Chesapeake Bay and, and these poor, in. to get in with them and these poor fish, just like, you know, swimming around, having picking up plankton, yes, doing their thing. Path. And then all of a sudden it's like whoop in the net and they're just body to body just being yeah. Yeah. sucked. You got to show up. it. It's mm -hmm. terrible, you know. But yeah, um, but show don't tell. If you're going to really do change making journalism, you have to try to show as much as you can, mm -hmm. not tell about it. Okay, yeah. we've got two questions. Um, first question is Ian, how do you protect yourself from the dangers? Oops. Dangers of such reportages investigations? It, it, it varies. I mean, the, the big investigation we did before this was looking at the abuse of migrants who were trying to cross the Mediterranean and get to Europe. And um, most of them were leaving from Libya. So I took a team to Libya. I did the on land. I do all the at sea and conflict zone reporting. Um, and then I have teams that do other stuff. We had a team on a Doctors Without Borders ship who were doing rescues for five weeks um, on the Mediterranean. And then I took a team into Libya. Um, a case like that, you know, Libya is one of the most dangerous places to go as a journalist. And we, we ended up getting taken by a militia and it was, you know, pretty horrific. So there are times that I would point to where um, there's only so much you can do um, short of not going there. Um, we, we have lots of protocols and devices. You know, we wear these garments. Anyone that's with me, they have to abide by very certain rules. They're never allowed to be on deck any time of the day unless someone else knows they're there. They always have to have this thing on them. Um, we have a protocol if we're in conflict zones where we're checking with the uh, on land staff uh, every six hours. And if we go dark, then they you know, initiate a whole emergency plan, contacting the State Department, et cetera. Um, truth be told, the at sea stuff, I've not ever had bad things happen and I've been doing it a long time. The threats there are not really that someone's going to do you harm, like the captain. If he lets you on the ship, you're his guest. He'll kick you off. You might get arrested. We've been, we were arrested by the Ecuadorian Navy on request from the Chinese when we came back from that reporting trip. And they arrested me and my crew and kicked us out of the country because they had gotten wind that we were boarding with permission Chinese vessels on the high seas, not your Ecuadorian jurisdiction. But when we went back to port, someone had made a call and we know this from the US ambassador. So we get arrested often um, and that's not fun. But on land, um, it's conflict zone. And at sea, it's industrial settings, right? So you're working 20 hour days, it's the middle of the night, it's a slippery deck, no one knows when you're on the back of the ship, you're, you're trying to film something, you slip, you fall overboard, no one's gonna know, you know, for a while. Um, so these are the, or infection, or something hits you in the head, the, the injuries, these are the real risks. So you gotta be really um, careful about not pushing yourself too far and slowing everything down if you can. And, um, and climbing, the big physical risk, is often if you get lucky and can climb onto that ship, um, that transfer is really perilous. You're climbing, yes. uh, you know, a rope ladder <laughs> that's three stories tall, and if you fall, you're in the water and the ship is bouncing up and down, and you're going to get sucked mm -hmm. under. And that's bad. Um, but so far, we've not ever had any injuries um, uh, in the process. Thankfully. Yeah. Thankfully. Thankfully. <laughs> okay. Next question: What could I do in New Zealand? to lay open the squid origin and Chinese fleet information. Uh, New Zealand's interesting. There's some good work. There's a woman named Kat Dory, you guys probably know, who's been around forever. And she's working in New Zealand with some others. I can't remember what NGOs, but on trying to get more attention on the lack of supply of traceability and import controls in New Zealand. New Zealand and Australia are pretty weak on that stuff. Um, so there's efforts to try to get more monitoring so that because these are import places right they're islands right mm -hmm. so they they really need to bring in a lot of um but so far there's not a whole lot there in terms of codes on the packaging in the u.s there are some codes that sometimes the plant codes that can tell you exactly where the plant came from that's normally historically tied to food safety concerns mm -hmm. you know a, a outbreak of salmonella you want to know exactly what plant to lock down but it's been immensely useful for us I think the answer about 
food safety is if you haven't caught it yourself, aware. Especially yeah, local, local, right? yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's right. Okay, the last question. Um, do you think your investigation caught it see human right infringements at its worst point in recent years, uh, 2000 to today, or else has bonded labor, enslavement, et cetera, been a uh, conscious and linear increase alongside the overfishing? No, I mean, I read some history books about stuff that happened two centuries ago, and it's hard to compare. I mean, you know, um, so I don't think um, by any metric, um, things are worse now than they were a hundred years ago. I, I don't have that impression. I think, um, th they have changed. So the types of crimes are different and there is a pervasiveness of wage theft, of, of violence short of murder, of, um, captivity. These sorts of crimes are really pervasive now in distant water fishing fleets, Thai, South Korean, Taiwanese, um, Chinese, to some degree, even Western, French, US, Spanish, you know, we're working on that. We don't, we haven't done that, pinned that down yet. But um, so I think that, um, but to the second point, to what degree is there an interplay between the, the illegal fishing, the environmental crimes, the marine crimes and the human crimes? That's an interesting question and I do think there's a hand in glove relationship because both of these yeah there are evil people out there and I believe in the existence of evil people and they're often in my stories but the real driver of the behavior isn't their evilness the bigger driver is just calculations of how can they make ends meet there's a financial process and these are usually cost saving steps you you don't use Cambodian trafficked 18 year olds because you're evil you use them because they're cheap that's yeah. your bigger reason. You might beat them one extra time because you enjoy it. Now you're evil, but you're engaging in a financial decision and you don't steal fish because you think it's better than getting legal fish. You steal them because it's time-wise, energy-wise, and cost-wise more viable for you. So, um, so I think they go hand in glove. They go together. They're caused by the same incentive. Yeah. All right. Well, we were a little past the top of the hour. <laughs> and we, thank you so much, Ian. It's been a wonderful conversation. We're extraordinarily grateful for you taking the time to, to dive in with us today. Um, My pleasure. And before we go, we wanted to say thank you to Ocean Elders and to everyone out there in the diving community that participates in these conversations. Water connects us all, and we are incredibly grateful. Uh, next time, we're going to be back with Carl Safina our year end and until then remember take care of the ocean as if your life depends on it because it does it does, it does. It does. <laughs> and we're depending on you ian for more uh, information keep at it let us know how the diving community can help you yes i will thanks so much all right bye for now <laughs>